I'm in Dubai, exploring the Burj Khalifa, the world's tallest building. I want to know how you make something this big in the Arabian desert. A vast sandscape that makes for one of the least suitable skyscraper environments on Earth. To find out, I met up with Bill Baker, the structural engineer responsible for building the Burj. No, we're not out having fun. You're looking at two men doing science, because Bill and I have come out to the desert to assess the suitability for building the foundations for the world's tallest building. And my assessment thus far is, it's really soft. <laughs> and it shifts about a lot. Right. So what we've learned from that in-depth and thorough scientific exploration is, if I scrape away at this sand for like a really long way, yep. Is a sort of a big lump of granite that you can anchor your building to? No. Problem. OK, so, so we have no bedrock here. OK, so under the sand, what we have is ancient seashell dust, a soft material called calcisiltite that was deposited in some ancient ocean. That's what we're sitting on. But if you're building that high, you need foundation. What are you going to anchor it to? Say we were working in snow. No. What would you do? A snowshoe. Yeah, so, so that's what we did. We start out with a snowshoe. And I just happen to have with me a model of the base. At the bottom of the Burj Khalifa, the world's tallest building, we have a big snowshoe. So this is a great big concrete slab. Yes. This so, shape. Yeah, so it's the size of the building, a little bit bigger. So that's spreading my way, so I'm not sinking down. Right, right. But there's a bigger problem. What's stopping it falling over? <laughs> Below this, we drilled 194 shafts of concrete into this calcium siltite. So in the simplest possible terms, it doesn't sink because it's on this giant sand shoe. And these piles, they're still in effectively sand. Yes. So the thing that's holding it up yeah. is friction. Just friction? Yes. It seems inconceivable that the world's tallest building is held up by something as simple as the friction generated between 194 concrete shafts driven into ancient seashell dust. But actually, friction is one of the strongest forces on the planet. To demonstrate the awesome power of friction, Bill and I are going to conduct an experiment using these two old telephone directories. And if you're under 25 and are wondering what these big books are, they're what your parents used to use to look up telephone numbers before we had the internet, and when we could still think. And what we're going to do is interleave them page by page. And you'll notice, every time we do that, there's a little bit of friction in evidence between those two pages. It's not a lot on a page-by-page -page basis, but once you've done it, I don't know, what is it? It'll be 1,600 times. It should be considerably more. This shouldn't take too long, but while we're doing it, you might want to look up at the sky for a moment or two. And there we go, two phone books completely interleaved page by page that Bill and I just did ourselves on our own under the baking sun with no help from production whatsoever. The point is, there's no glue holding these together, they're just interleaved. And I think let's have a little tug of war. Go. Good grief! <laughs> there is no way! That is an immense amount. <laughs> That is, it feels like one solid block, doesn't it? And that is yes, just friction in action. But I think we need to up the effort uh -oh. a bit, introduce some more force. It's one nil to friction so far, but maybe we can even the score with the help of two dune buggies and 344 horsepower. We've bolted brackets to the spines, but the books and buggies are still held together by nothing more than the friction between the pages. OK, Bill, in three, two, one, begin. We're now having a tug of war. We are held only by friction. Come on! This is a mighty off-road racer. Just friction. It's holding back these two vehicles at full throttle. All I can do is dig a hole, it seems. Bill, I think the book's won. <laughs> I I'm think so. Have a look at that. <laughs> Bill, you buried it, mate. Friction won. Yes. And that is the effect that holds up 
the tallest building in the world. Yes. On the Burj Khalifa, those 194 piles that go down uh, into the ground, they have 40,000 square meters of concrete against 40,000 square meters of ground. Yes, yeah, so you had a 40,000 square meter page of concrete yes. against a 40,000 square meter page of sand. Yes. That's a lot of friction. Yes, that's right. That's so it's it. enough to hold up the world's tallest building. In fact, the friction is so strong that the Burj Khalifa, all 828 gravity-defying meters of it, is supported by foundations stuck just 50 meters into the desert. But what happens when they're really put to the test? Dubai can be hit by sandstorms and winds up to 100 kilometers an hour, which is a big problem for big buildings. But not necessarily in the way you may think. Cue our hurricane in a box. Well, let's turn on the wind. So the wind is going this way. So it's pulling the wind in here. Yes. And it's waggling about from side to side. It's not even remotely trying to do no, no, no. that. No. It's going to do that. Yeah, if a tall building were ever to fall over in the wind, it would probably fall over sideways, not in the direction of the wind. And this is the tall building problem. When wind swirls around a building, it forms small whirlwinds called vortices. These alternating pockets of low air pressure create forces on the building that can cause it to rock from side to side. Not as much as this, obviously, I've exaggerated it to make a point, but you get the idea. All skyscrapers have a natural frequency, the rate at which they like to vibrate, just like this swing. If I push it gently, it'll settle down and settle into its natural frequency. Now the bit where it gets fun, because I have a go. Imagine this swing is the skyscraper, and my legs are the wind. On a perfectly flat-faced, symmetrical skyscraper, the wind can work with that natural frequency to actually increase the rate at which I'm swinging. It's called harmonic resonance. On a swing, we use harmonic resonance to go higher. But on the world's tallest building, it could cause it to sway more and more until it fell over. To stop that happening, Bill and his colleagues had to design a skyscraper radically different from any other. This is essentially the Burj Khalifa. The key aspects of this is how the shape of the floor plate constantly changes. As we go up, there's 27 different shapes uh, in the tower, and each of them uh, will, will generate vortices slightly different than the ones above or below them. So you never get really large forces on the building because they're always coming off at different rates. And because of that, the wind never gets organized. We actually call this confusing the wind. In order to make sure the wind is well and truly confused, the Burj Khalifa isn't square like a traditional skyscraper. It's Y-shaped. It gets narrower as it rises, its edges are curved, and its cross-section is constantly changing. And this design breaks up the force of the wind. What the birds does is what my legs are doing now, which is not working in harmony with the natural frequency of the skyscraper. And as a result, there's barely any swing getting going. Because I've only got two legs. The Burj effectively has 27, because it has 27 different levels up its length to break the wind up so it doesn't get organized and establish harmonic resonance. It's good, this. Harmonic resonance, harmonic dissonance. <laughs>